So we're going to go over some of the basics of copyright, starting with sound recordings. This is going to be very, very, very high level. So um, we're not going to get into a whole lot of uh, copyright oriented detail here. The thing to remember about every sound recording, which includes digital files on the internet, is that there are two copyrights in every sound recording of a musical work. Uh, and in sound recordings of anything other than a musical work, there's a pretty good chance there's another copyright of something else, too. Um, and that's important to remember, because if you, one of the most common mistakes uh, is for someone to clear the master rights and forget to clear the song rights for the same work. Whatever use you're making of it, whether it's online, you're putting it in a movie, you're putting it in a TV show, you're getting a sample clearance, you know, whatever it might be, don't forget there's two copyrights, right? Um, the sound recording copyright is the P in the circle. I didn't have a P in the circle in my font, so I'm improvising here. And that P stands for phonorecord, which is the technical term of a sound-only um, copyright in the Copyright Act, which you will find in Section 101 if, for those who are reading along. Um, and I suggest that you actually get a copy of the Copyright Act. If you're interested in this area of the law, you can get it. It's Circular 92 that can be downloaded off of the Copyright Office website for free in a searchable PDF form. And I really wish when I was in law school I'd had a searchable PDF form of the Copyright Act because it sure does save a lot of time. Because, you know, you can remember these fragments and you can't remember exactly where they came from. You can search for the fragment and find it very easily. Uh, so I highly recommend people get that download. Uh, and if you're serious about this business, you're, you're going to need that. The other copyright that's in the sound recording is the musical work or song also known as a non-dramatic musical work in the Copyright Act, uh, which is something you find most of the attention drawn to in Section 115, and that's usually represented by the C in the circle. Um, we're not going to get into the notice or lack of need for notice um, issue, but there have been some changes in that, although I still advise people to put a notice on everything, even though you don't have to anymore. Copyright for the song and the copyright for the sound recording can be owned by different people and frequently are. Um, so that means that just when, you, when you've gone through this knockdown, drag out struggle with EMI to get the recording rights, let's say, for something that you want to use, uh, you now have the joy of going and dealing with possibly two or more publishers uh, to clear the same rights. If it's particularly if it's for a movie where it's a synchronization license, something where you don't have um, a compulsory license available to you. Audiovisual works include music videos, right? So if you're thinking about starting to apply these facts into the digital world, music videos are found on YouTube, right? So what I just said was there's no compulsory license for the synchronization right, so that means YouTube can't rely on a compulsory license the way you know, a record company could if they otherwise complied with the requirements of the compulsory license. There isn't one, which means that they have to go out. Somebody either has to agree to take responsibility for it, which is what happened with YouTube, or they have to go out song by song by song, writer by writer by writer, and clear all these works. So each music video essentially contains three, cop three copyrights. The phonorecord copyright and the sound recording that's embodied in the video, the soundtrack of the video, and then the song, right? So that's a second copyright. And in this case, if we're talking about a music video, that's a synchronization right, as well as the reproduction right. And then the C in the circle copyright for the audiovisual work as a whole. Now, in the case of music videos, um, all these different rights can be owned by different people, but they're generally owned, but the, but the music video is generally owned by the same people who own the sound recording. And the way those rights are treated is under the artist's 
recording agreement as a general rule so that the music video is produced under that deal, all the rights are granted under that deal, including the synchronization rights for the song, which are granted to the record company. And in, you know, in the older deals, that wasn't quite as clear, you know, that the record company could transfer those rights to a third party. But that has become increasingly clear as music videos, which used to be kind of a backwater, something you never really did anything with commercially, uh, are now becoming important assets of the record company because they can sell them over mobile phones, they can sell them on YouTube, or essentially sell them, they can earn revenue from them uh, on YouTube, sell them as downloads on iTunes and so on. So this is becoming more and more important and you don't want to, as a record company, you don't want to get hung up trying to go chase down um, synchronization rights for songs in the music videos. So, what you have to remember in the basics is that whenever you're looking at a license uh, or, or a deal, let's say online, uh, you have to, whether you're representing the retailer or you're representing the um, um, copyright owner, you have to make sure that you've closed off all these issues. If you take YouTube, for example, the way they close it off is they have a deal with the record company to give them the video and the record company takes responsibility for clearing the sync, right? Um, they probably, YouTube itself probably ought to have a deal with ASCAP and BMI to cover the performance right, which we didn't really talk about here, but every time they play that video there's a performance right in the song that's implicated, just like it would be if it were played on television. And so when um, you think about those issues in the context of audio only records, um, you can imagine the situation that Steve Jobs was in when he wanted to start iTunes. Because um, although he wasn't talking about videos initially, uh, he was planning on distributing audio recordings and audio recordings have to have the publishing cleared as well you have to get a mechanical license for the reproduction of the audio recording. And so Steve Jobs looks out at this morass of rights in America, at least, uh, and says, you know, someone's going to have to go on the hook for this because I am not chasing down all these publishers. And so the record company said, we'll handle the publishing. And one of the ways they can do that is through uh, a, a change in the Copyright Act, which all the publishers say was, was slipped through, um, that allows record companies to grant mechanical licenses that they've already obtained for CD sales for download sales. So they, instead of having to go re-clear all that, all that publishing, the record company can just say, iTunes, you pay me the mechanical and I'll pay it out. Now, of course, the publishers are not real happy about that, right? Because that means they don't have direct audit rights against iTunes. They have to wait to get their money at least two quarters after it's been paid to the labels. And they have no way of knowing whether they're getting a straight count. So that is one of the sort of tension points out there in our business that's going to get resolved eventually. But you can also see that there, there would have been no iTunes if Jobs had to go out and clear out all those millions and millions of songs, millions and millions of licenses for songs. So that's not really so much a deal point when you go to negotiate one of these deals. Uh, there really aren't that many things to negotiate in an iTunes deal. And frankly, there isn't anything to negotiate in an iTunes deal, really, because iTunes will just send you their deal and you sign it, and that's it. There's no negotiation. But there has been, you know, that's really only taken hold in the last couple of years. The first couple of years they operated, there was some negotiation and there was some back and forth. And they modified, I mean, they, they try to be fair at Apple, but they also need to get business done. So uh, there's only so much they're going to do. The price is usually 70 cents wholesale. So in other words, if you represent a record company, or an artist, an individual artist, or an aggregator, and we'll talk more about aggregators. Um, that's the price per track 
that you're going to get for a permanent download sale in the United States. Um, you'll get that paid to you as a record company monthly or as an aggregator monthly, whoever's the contracting party, whether it's a record company or the aggregator. That'll get paid to you monthly and then you will in turn pay that out uh, to the artist based on whatever your deal is with them. <coughs> Albums are usually $7 because they take basically 10 times the wholesale price for the individual track. And that's if the track is sold in the iTunes DRM, which is called Fair Play. Um, and Fair Play is a proprietary version of another file format called AAC. And these file formats are basically just compression codecs that um, allow a WAV file, which might, let's say, for a three-minute song, might be, you know, 70 meg, something like that, to be reduced down to three or four. And the way it does that is it says the human ear won't notice the human ear only hears from about 60 cycles in the bass to about 20,000 cycles in the treble, right? Most people don't really hear above about 18, right? Above 20, you know, dogs start to bark. And below 20, strange things happen to your digestive system if you get hit with a strong enough um, sound pressure blast of below 60 hertz. So um, it was used for crowd control and actually in Vietnam uh, <laughs> on the big gigantic speakers that they roll out. So if you ever see big gigantic speakers roll out in the crowd that's going out of control, get out of there because bad things are about to happen. Uh, but that, but Fair Play is, a, is Apple's version of AAC. So they licensed AAC as a format then they wrapped it in a, a proprietary format. So it's sort of like a double codec that only Apple owns. The other, um, and that, well, just back on that, that, that's about to go away because Apple is gonna start selling in MP, exclusively in MP3. And the pricing for the MP3 hasn't been announced yet, so. But it'll be somewhere, it'll be a little bit higher probably than 70 cents, because the retail price will probably be somewhere between um, like $1.19 and $1.29, somewhere in that range. Um, most of the time, Apple isn't interested. Once you've got a deal with Apple, they don't ever want to, you know, they just want it to chug along. They want you to add content. When you're ready to add content, they have a program called Producer that allows you, as an indie, to just upload it. If you're a major, there's other ways with FTP sites and and even hard drives uh, if you have to transfer a whole lot of information. Uh, but most of these deals for indies just auto renew. They just turn over. And they're usually like three year deals and they'll renew automatically after three years. The majors have one year deals. And so when you hear this about Doug Morris is you know, not gonna renew his contract with Apple, that's because it came up and they decided for strategic reasons that they weren't gonna do it. You're never, you know, unless you're working at a major label, that's not something you'll ever have to worry about. You'll, you, the main thing you'll worry about if you're not working at a major label is if you don't have an aggregator, you've got to try to get somebody from iTunes to return your phone call, right? And that can sometimes take a very, very, very long time. And maybe never, right? I mean, I've picked, I have my own digital distribution company, uh, and I have my own deals with iTunes, um, and I, I had a label that I distribute come to me and say they've been trying to get a deal with iTunes for two years and they haven't been able to get a return phone call. And they had an artist that was about to go out on a major tour that summer. And I said, well, look, even if, you, even if I called them and got you the contract today and even if you signed it without reading it, uh, it would still take you six weeks to get set up in the royalty system. And by the time that happened, your artist would be off the road. You know, so why don't you just let me put you out? I'll get you up in 10 days or so. And uh, that's what we did, and he's been with us ever since. Now, of course, what happens in these deals um, is that you have, uh, you have some concerns about 
how you get out of them. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the aggregator deals. Because um, if you're a major label, you're probably not going to really be that interested in getting out of your iTunes deal. But if you're an indie signed through an aggregator and you then get an opportunity to sign to a major label, but you've given all your exclusive digital distribution rights to the aggregator, that's kind of a tough conversation to have these days <laughs> with a record company. It's like, you know, you can have everything except digital. You know, that that's a trip to, you know, file 13. Um, So aggregators are a creature, really a creature of iTunes, and a creature of the fact that um, it's very difficult for these big companies, um, big, big digital companies like Real or Napster or iTunes or any of these companies to do individual one-off deals with artists, independent artists, with small labels. They just don't have the capacity to do it. They don't want to have that many contracts out there so what they do is they um, make a deal with someone who makes a business of going out and making those deals, which is an aggregator. So iTunes is happy to do a deal with uh, IOTA, for example, or The Orchard or CD Baby. There's, there's a few of these, TuneCore, um, people who go out and they sign up independent artists or they'll sign up small labels and they'll put it out through, the, the, the aggregator will take in the content and the aggregator will then go make deals with all these different digital outlets for you. They take a fee for that, uh, but that's a way for you to get up on these digital services if you don't have um, the ability to get a direct deal. Um, very often they'll take a setup fee. Be careful with that. Um, that's sometimes the only money they ever make um, if, you, if you don't sell very much. So they sometimes can jack that price up. Uh, on the retailer side, companies like The Orchard will charge you something like $100,000 for the, for the initial download of all their content. That's money they do not share with the artists. That goes straight to The Orchard's bottom line. And then the aggregator will take 10 to 30% of your revenue on top of that. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to be in this game, you've got to play this game because you're not going to get up there otherwise. Um, there are aggregators that will tell you about how they market your records and how they do this and how they do that. They don't do anything. You know, if you're lucky, they'll actually get your stuff up on these services in a reasonable period of time. Beyond that, you know, Hard to say. I think IOTA makes a pretty good effort at trying to put people in, you know, in a new release situation in front of a number of uh, potential consumers. But real marketing and real publicity costs real money. So if somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, you know, I can get you out there. And, you know, we we'll put you here. We're going to put you there. We're going to get to promote you. Blah blah blah." And it's fifty bucks. You know, that cannot be true. It just simply cannot be true. And there are plenty of people out there who do that, and there are plenty of artists who pay that. Just as a reference point, uh, one of our independent artist clients, our independent label clients, um, was able to beat their label into submission and get them to agree to pay for a tour publicist on a West Coast tour that we were doing with them, and that was a thousand bucks a month to do tour press, which is relatively straightforward. It's stuff we could have done ourselves. It's just that it's easier if you have somebody else do it, and they, they will always you know, bring some value. You know, it's not, if, if for no other reason than, than the, the news outlet is getting it from a publicist who they trust, right? So that's worth paying some money for. That's 1000 bucks a month, right? That's, that's a cheap deal with a top-level publicist. And we pay. We were on the road for three months, so it cost us three grand. A big publicist who just who you just sort of put on a retainer, you know, not necessarily tour related and not necessarily event related, just someone on a retainer to try to help you build your image. 
top people in that world get uh, five grand a month. You don't need someone like that when you're first starting out. But just as a reference point. So when these people come to you and say 50 bucks a month, it's a joke. Because a $50 publicist will do a $50 job. Surprise, surprise. There's no magic to being on the internet. It's still the same basic problems that you have offline. Another trick that some of these aggregators try to pull is they try to get you to let them sign you up to Sound Exchange. Does anybody not know what Sound Exchange is? Okay. So in back to the, to the sound to the sound recording, right? In the United States, we are in the proud company of countries like North Korea in the sense that we do not pay a performance royalty for sound recordings on terrestrial radio. Uh, we, as of 1995, and then again in 1998, there, was, there were amendments to the Copyright Act that provided for a, a royalty payable on public performance of sound recordings in the digital format. So you've probably heard, speaking to Tim Westergren, you've, you've probably heard about the problems Pandora is having with the webcasting rates, right? The, 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 the compulsory license for webcasting. They've been in this knockdown, drag out, bloodbath negotiation um, about the rates being too high. Uh, and the people that they're negotiating with are Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange is a nonprofit organization that administers the webcasting royalty and a few other things. You, as an artist or an artist representative, your clients are going to be able to sign up with Sound Exchange directly. Um, there's no reason why anybody has to do it for you or for them, aside from the lawyer. I mean, if the lawyer can just walk them through it, it's pretty easy. Um, if they own the sound recordings, they'll be able to get the sound recording registration because there are three payments that are made under the webcasting royalties, which are to the feature artist, the sound recording owner, and then there's 5% that's split between two unions, AFTRA and AFM, which their trust funds uh, collect and administer. So this is, this is like about a five-minute deal. You know, you go to the website, you download the form, you send it in with a W-9, you know, and you're done, right? The follow-up is to make sure they actually get you in the system and they're actually registered, you know, registering you and they have your repertoire registered and that they're actually collecting. That's... But you have that problem with everybody. So whatever it is, you don't need to pay an aggregator to do that for you because that's just basically free money for the aggregator. Um, and I would also advise you to double check if you do sign up with an aggregator to make sure that they haven't actually gone and registered this content for you anyway because what some of them do is they collect, even for independent artists who own their sound recording copyright, the aggregators collect the sound recording owner's share as their own, and that's 50%, right? And then if you call them on it, they go, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know how these things happen. And um, so it's always good to double check. Now that's, we've been basically talking about permanent downloads. There's another kind of deal or other kinds of services where you have on-demand streaming and a music subscription, and that's like Rhapsody or Napster or those kinds of services. Um, the way that the artists and sound recording owners get paid in those deals is a revenue share that's based on usage. Uh, the revenue share is uh, prorated by taking your plays, stuff of your content, and dividing it by the total plays of everything on the service during that period. Uh, and then you multiply that times uh, gross revenue less permitted deductions. Um, and revenue comes from subscription fees, advertising, various sources, um, banners sometimes. There's an argument about various elements of this, which is probably a little too detailed for this meeting, but um, basically, 
any money that the service gets. Um, and then they get to deduct certain things like um, what they have to pay the publisher. Remember, this is from a sound recording owner's perspective. Um, so they get to deduct what they pay the publishers and the societies. And then there's sort of the other category of whatever else they can get away with deducting. Sometimes they'll try to deduct their bandwidth. The answer to that is that's your overhead. I'm not paying you to run your business. Um, they're, they're sort of standard responses to almost all these, all these points. But there is uh, one surefire way to make sure you don't get screwed too badly, which is to have an overall cap on what they can deduct, um, which will strangely become the deduction, right? <laughs> and one thing about a cap, as soon as you put a cap on something, the other side will almost always just set all their deductions at that cap, even if the deductions are less. And by the time you, you, you better have a very valuable audit claim because going in and trying to question all that is not really very profitable. So most people just accept it. And so the cap in these situations is usually 20 to 25 percent. And then you also try to get a per stream minimum so that no matter what happens, um, you know you're going to not get less than a penny a play or so. <coughs> and of course that just like the cap becomes the rate, or becomes the standard deduction, the per stream minimum becomes the rate. Because it's a lot easier to calculate a per stream minimum than it is to calculate a revenue share. So, if you go through an aggregator um, that already has all their deals set up, and you're what they call a latecomer uh, to the deal, meaning that there's already kind of a model set up and, and deals done. There is a standard negotiation tool in the music business, not just the music business, but which is called MFN. Does anybody know what MFN stands for? No? Most Favored Nations? A grandiose term which is uh, copped from the world where things that really are important happen, such as international trade. Um, but we use it commonly in the music business. And what that basically means is I get the same as everybody else. Nobody else gets anything better than me. Um, of course, whenever you ask for or you give MFN protection, you always have to ask MFN with whom, right? Because there would be a lot of people. Um, although most people who sign up with an aggregator are kind of more or less in the same pos economic position in life. Uh, and then you also have to ask MFN about what? Um, because what you're really trying to get at is the financial terms. And if you're the aggregator and someone's asking you to give MFN, you don't want to have to comb through, you don't want to be in breach just because you gave somebody a slightly better indemnity provision, you know, which is not really what they're negotiating for. Um, the other question you have to ask yourself when you're the, when you're the, the giver of MFN is uh, how in the world are you ever going to prove without disclosing everybody else's deal if you ever get called on it that you're treating everybody the same? Right, because every single one of those deals will also have a confidentiality provision in it. Right, so you always have to, when you're granting the MFN, you have to think about um, how you deal with audits. And it's not a very popular thing to say. Is yeah, no problem. I'll grant you MFN, but you'll never be able to prove it. Right, uh, but that's one of the things that you have to think about. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask. For MFN, but you probably won't get it unless they really want to, unless they really want you in there. But it's it never as when you when you get out into the wide and wonderful world of the law, there will be a whole bunch of things that you learn to ask for, even though you know you're not going to get them. But you want to have asked for them, so no one can say you didn't ask for them. How come there's a confidentiality? What's the importance of having that? Well, that's a good question. The the, uh, the page of history is worth a volume of logic theory uh, comes into play here. It is very, very common in tech deals to have confidentiality provisions about practically everything. 
you know, whether the CEO wears a blue shirt or a white shirt, you know, it, and it, that, con that concept kind of got tracked into these digital deals because when they were first getting done, people who were doing them were usually technology companies, and so they took what they knew and they tried to add things to it, right? Another reason that you have confidentiality in there is because of the major labels, right? The major labels don't want anybody talking about their deals uh, for a number of reasons. They don't want auditors finding out, <laughs> you know, they don't want their artists finding out, you know, they, they really like to keep it quiet. It's not so much the rate that they want to keep quiet, it's the advance, right? And if we have time, I'll get into why that advance thing is uh, important. Um, so let's talk a little bit about publishing issues. Um, remember, permanent download services do require the payment of mechanical royalty. We talked about that a little bit. Um, we talked about the pass along a little bit. This is a very hot button issue with publishers, and there's actually active negotiations going on right now to try to get rid of it. The problem you have in this country is that there's no one place you can go to get a true blanket license for mechanical royalties. You can get a blanket license for performances, but it's virtually impossible to get one for um, mechanicals unless you want to take advantage of the compulsory license rules, which is a very, very time-consuming, headachey process because you have to go through the copyright office. And believe me, the copyright office doesn't want to become a royalty accountant. That, they kind of got stuck with that many years ago when nobody was using the compulsory license and nobody thought anyone ever would use the compulsory license, but it was there sort of like as a doorstop to finish a thought, you know. However, outside the United States, it's very easy to get a blanket license for mechanical royalties, and there's been a lot of pressure in this country to follow the path from overseas. Um, in Canada, for example, um, you can go, Canada is the most like the United States where they have the CSI, which is the Mechanical Royalty Society, then they have something called SOCAN, which is the Performing Rights Society, which is similar to how we have um, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and then we have the Harry Fox Agency, except CSI is the Harry Fox Agency on steroids, and they can, they can actually grant a license for probably 95% of songs in Canada. When you go to Europe, they are the only game in town as a general rule. And so they, they do both, like MCPS PRS uh, is both mechanicals and performances. So when you go there, you just get a license and that covers all the rights. You don't have a payment to the, for the performance and a payment for the mechanicals. You may account separately so because they still do um, internally within MCPS PRS they still do allocate the money that comes in a little bit differently um, but you as the retailer don't have to have two completely sets of separate sets of books and SOSM is the French version the same thing there's there's one for every country um, if you've ever looked at iTunes, or, um, Rhapsody or Napster, or some of these streaming services, and notice that there's tranches of catalog that just aren't there, one of the reasons for that is because they haven't been able to clear the publishing. And there has been a, a fight over something called the streaming mechanical um, for a, probably, that fight's been going on for about 10 years. It just got resolved sort of, um, in the last few weeks. Um, and there was a decision of the Copyright Royalty Board, who are also known as the Copyright Royalty Judges, um, that set a rate, uh, finally, for um, streaming mechanicals and, and said it was a compulsory rate, meaning that it would come under the compulsory provisions of Section 115 that had always applied to uh, regular old mechanicals on CDs or permanent downloads. Um, so that should mean the end or the beginning of the end for the pass along license uh, because now you have a, something which is effectively a blanket rate. Um, 
However, our friends at the RIAA appealed that decision, and um, so it's still slightly in limbo, although people can rely on it at the moment, and there, people are still are now granting licenses uh, pending the appeal. So the appeal won't um, have the effect of uh, really changing any business practices. So as we talked about, you know, when you have these streaming services, these subscription services, those are still performances and those have to get licensed by ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC in this country. And then offshore you have your uh, Authors' Rights Society license, which will, which will include performances. So user-generated content is the other... Um, sort of big bucket of uh, deals and rights that need to get done, uh, which is uh, probably best exemplified as by YouTube. So we'll use YouTube as an example here. Uh, it's usually videos, although it doesn't have to be. And of course that implicates the synchronization license. Uh, we talked about YouTube has made these large deals with the major labels to use music videos that have um, songs in them and the, and the major labels are taking care of synchronization license. However, if it's uh, the rest of the videos that are up there, which is probably most of the videos that are up there, um, those deals don't necessarily cover um, independent artist videos, independent label videos, dancing baby videos, that kind of thing. So YouTube has some exposure um, for the use of those kinds of videos on their service, whether it's just taking clips, you know, where there's no dancing baby involved, it's just a copy of something that exists already, or it's something like a home video. There is no blanket synchronization license, um, which is something that um, is so obvious that it's hard for me to understand why anybody at YouTube ever thought that they would get away with this. And yet, they did. There's no standard synchronization rate. As we discussed, it depends on who controls the licenses for um, who controls licenses or music video or on videos, audiovisual content depends on the kind of content it is. So if it's a music video, the chances are the label will control it, but it could be a cover song, in which case they may not have gotten the clearance. Or it could be co-written by an outside writer who's refused to take the artist's control composition clause. In these situations, when somebody's waving enough money under their nose, like $50 million usually doesn't, um, the label will take the risk. Because the label has a relationship with these publishers on other things, right? So if the publisher comes to them and starts kicking up trouble about a license on YouTube, the label will be able to say, ah, yeah, but you know that, that sync that you wanted us to go along with you on for X movie, you know? I'm thinking, you know, I said 100,000. I think 200,000 would be the number. And I don't know where they're going to get it from, but probably from your sync license. You know, at which point the point is made and the YouTube issue goes away. Because these people have much more at stake in terms of doing business with each other over the long term. Nobody gives a damn about YouTube at the end of the day, right? It's just money, um, particularly for the publishers. Now, in a, in a movie, the studio is going to cover, is going to control the rights for almost all music in the film. Because in the film, uh, if it's the score, the movie, the movie studio almost always owns the score outright. Um, you'll have, like when we did um, the soundtrack for uh, Robin Hood, which is a good example, the Everything I Do, I Do It For You, which was a big, big hit worldwide out of that movie, was actually a riff that Michael Kamen wrote in the score of the film, which Michael Kamen then turned into a song with Mutt Lang and Brian Adams. Um, that song 
because of Michael Kamen's deal as a superstar composer, was not part of what the studio owned. Because a lot of these big composers will say, yeah, you get my score, but if I write any songs, I control that. If I write any songs that, can, that include any of the motifs from the score, I control that. Or you get a small sliver of that, but it's really mine. It's my song. Um, so the studio may not control every single thing in the film, but they have the light. They have the right, and they have the right to sub-license it um, to other people. So when you're talking about movies that are up on YouTube or one of these services, um, on the publishing side, that will come from the studio, almost invariably. Um, TV shows are a little more interesting uh, and not so cut and dried because when you go to clear music for a TV show, this is usually a series of options. For example, now what you find, you used to find the, the initial option would be US free and basic cable, right? Free TV and basic cable. Now it's US free TV, basic cable, and internet. Or internet on, our, on, the, on the stations, um, not, no, sorry, on the producer's site. So you'd have, you know, like the Grey's Anatomy website. So if you clear music for Grey's Anatomy, then you're also letting Grey's Anatomy play it back on the Grey's Anatomy website. And then the next step after that is and any set websites that syndicates to. So now it's a little bit broader. But what it isn't is <laughs> worldwide, right? Because that's another option. And the reason why the TV shows are, are, are carved into a series of options is because you don't know when you're doing the TV show and you're producing the initial episodes what, what your distribution pattern is going to be and whether you're going to want to pay for it or not, right, um, up front. So you get lower prices by creating a series of options that have an option exercise price for each one. And then you'll also have a home video option and, you know, query whether, which usually scoops up video on demand and things like that. So query whether this is YouTube is video on demand, home video, you know, what is it? But if it's any of those things, those payments, depending on how far back it goes, can be anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000 per song. You know, and I almost guarantee you that the studios are not making five to ten thousand dollars per song by putting their clips up on YouTube. And if you have a show like 90210 or thinking back a little further, um, or Grey's Anatomy or Dawson's Creek or any of those shows that were real music intensive that had a lot of licensed music, you know, those payments can add up after a while. Um, and the way that UGC videos get compensated are basically the same that we saw on the uh, on-demand subscription streaming services, except you don't have subscription, you just have revenue. Uh, it's still your plays over total plays, except this is an interesting thing on YouTube because of their rather porous licensing practice. So how do you know what your plays are when it comes to user-generated content? And how do you know what their plays are, everybody else? I mean, you can't really construct a very accurate numerator or a very accurate denominator because what they're really saying is we'll include all the ones that we have licensed, right? So what ends up happening is your plays are up here and then there's this number which is kind of potentially infinite in the denominator, right? If you think to ask for a limitation on that denominator to be only things that they have licensed because if it's, if it's everything on YouTube, your numerator is going to get to be a very, very small fraction. There's going to be a lot of zeros out there to the right of the decimal point because if you're starting to include dancing babies, you know, um, leakage, you know, like uh, um, ephemeral source type music where somebody's out during Mardi Gras, you know, filming something and music slips in and they count that too, right? And, and you've got movies and you've got all these things. That denominator starts to get very big and your numerator is going to be relatively constant or smaller. And none of that stuff may be licensed. 
So you've got people who are being counted towards a share of gross revenue who don't participate in the gross revenue. And that's not right, right? So you have to be careful when you negotiate these things that you match likes with likes. And then, of course, there's what happens when they sell the company, right? Because they haven't paid you. I mean, at the time, YouTube was purchased by Google. Um, I don't think they had just closed the first of their licenses. And when that number got announced, everybody at the labels, studios, everybody in the creative community said, you know, where's mine? Right? Actors, artists, you know, are calling up, where's mine? How could they possibly have, that's all our stuff that they just sold, right? And uh, of course, very, very, very little of that ever found its way back to the artists, and none of it found its way back to the amateur videos, you know, to the Chocolate Rains and the Tron guys and those people. So, think about something else. When, when major labels go to a YouTube and they pound the table and call them infringers and do all the rest of it, and they get a big chunk of money, like $50 million, just to pick a number out of the air, if you might have been universal, um, not that I know but it might have been $50 million. Some of that money is going to be expressed as settlement of a claim. Now, what you'd know if you had read some artist agreements is that settlements of claims against the catalog, settlements of copyright infringement claims, are not shared with the artist, unless, except in very, very narrow circumstances and then only with people who have a lot of leverage and can get the point in their deal. So let's say half the money was uh, a settlement of a claim. $25 million straight to the bottom line, right? Doug's getting a good year off of one deal. He's just picked up $25 million. So that deal has a term, right? In their case, I think the term was two years. Um, so there's another $25 million that's an advance against the Universal Catalog. But that check got written to Universal. Universal cashed it for sure. That went straight to the bottom line. And then it's an advance against the catalog, though. So as the videos start to get played, artists should be entitled to some share of that money based on whatever their deals say. And trust me, it's a very, very small share of that money. But you can only give the artist a share of, their, of that money if you know what was played. And that means you have to get a statement from YouTube telling you what was played. And if Universal knows that if they get a very, very accurate statement from YouTube that will require them to take some of that $25 million out of the general account, column and put it into the royalty account column as an expense, are they excited about getting an accurate statement or are they not excited about getting an accurate statement? What is financially better for them, a lousy statement from YouTube or a great statement from YouTube? The answer is a lousy statement from YouTube because that means when that term ends, when that two-year point hits and they're unrecouped $25 million or $24,550,000. The clock starts over again. That advance doesn't roll forward to the new contract, right? That advance goes away, except it doesn't really go away. It goes into the universal general account. <laughs> Doug had another great year, right? Because he got another $24.5 million, basically for free. He doesn't have to share that with anybody because it's not attributable to any particular master. It's attributable to the catalog. So when you hear these stories about YouTube, I thought it was very interesting that um, CNET was running a series of stories, news.com was running a series of stories about how bad the accountings were at YouTube 
And um, the first people you heard from saying, we're happy about our relationship with YouTube was Universal. Big story that read like a press release. I mean, when you've been doing this for a while, you, get, you can tell when something's a press release and when it's a, you know organic news story, right? This read like a press release. It had statements from people, you know. And then Doug Morris said, and then so-and-so said, you know, and this is what you see in a press release. We're really happy about our relationship, blah, blah, blah. Everything's always good, right? So think about that. And by the way, it's just a thought thing and, and a training thing because there's nothing you can do about it when you represent an artist. You just suck it up. So there's a lot of twists and turns on this user-generated content stuff. We talked a little bit about it before. You know, is a UGC clip a home video release? Because if it is, that has some impact if you're in the movie business um, on, you know, your windows, right? Because if you've got uh, somebody who's supposed to get the home video and you're, and you're not in the home video window, and that person who's supposed to get the home video, which of course is usually your distributor if you're a major studio, but, um, or someone whose rights start after the home video window or extend before the home video window. All these people are gonna have a point of view about whether putting this thing up on YouTube, which you're kind of dragged to because they just put it up, right? They don't care about your windows. Um, whether that's a home video release, or that's a video on demand release, or that's a near video on demand release, because all those windows have been carved up, and people have paid for those. And here's the more interesting one. Um, is the UGC clip of a TV show or movie a reuse? An important word to remember, because it will come back to bite you if you get into this business whether you're in records, movies, or films, or uh, TV. Now, in the Screen Actors Guild agreement and in the AFTRA agreement, which are the two principal union agreements that control this business, um, of the film business, a reuse is something for which the featured performer gets to negotiate directly for additional consideration. And what that means is that if you license a clip, for example, if you were to say to YouTube, yes, that's fine, put that clip of the Beverly Hillbillies up there, right? Well, the estate of Granny, you know, Jethro, Ellie Mae, and the estate of old Jed, you know, are gonna be coming around saying, where's ours? The union's going to be coming around saying, where's our pension, health, and welfare contribution, right? So it's, it's a lot more complicated than um, any of these guys really um, want to address. And YouTube really doesn't care about the actors. You know, they don't care about the artists. They don't care about any of those people, really, because they got $1.65 billion, right? You can live on that for a long time. And if you go to the Googleplex, there's no dogs or actors allowed. It's a joke. Um, now Hulu, for example, which is owned by a couple of studios, um, will at least say that they care about whether the actors starve because they need to hire the actors for other things, right? Um, and they have an ongoing relationship with these people, and they're union signatories for the most part, um, so they kind of have to care. And they're the ones that are going to be on the hook, right? I mean, if they permit, if they authorize something which violates the guild agreements, then they've got a problem. Not YouTube, because YouTube's not a signatory. How are we doing on time? In about five minutes if you want to do a couple of questions. Okay, all right. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. I was going to go over a couple of the new, the newer things, but um, anybody have questions? Yes, ma'am. So if an artist, like an unsigned artist, was to put something up on a website, independent website, you know, my 
MySpace, for example, what kind of protection do they have? Is there anything that protects them? Well, they have the five-minute copyright, right? Okay. The five-minute copyright is when you get your CD and you look at it and you put it out into commerce, your copyright lasts about five minutes. And then someone will rip you off and put it up on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So the practical answer to your question is no. I mean, if you're an independent artist and you put anything up on the internet, you should just assume that it's going to go where it goes. Because people will download it. They'll, if you put it up in a stream, they'll use, some, not all, will use the stream ripper to make a download. Well, there is protection, but it has to be, you know, protection is only good as the people who respect the law, right? I mean, th there, there are ways you can prosecute people for copyright infringement, but as an independent artist, which was the premise of your question, you know, you don't have the money to do that. That's not a game that you can play. So you have to play a different game. What if you signed up for a site that protected you, and I guess, depending on the site, would they have enough power or money Well, they're not going to do that. Uh, I, I don't, if you find out who that site is, let me know, because I'd like to know. Uh, but they're, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, um, they'll protect themselves, right? And so the, the independent artist may end up getting some benefit from whatever moves these guys make to protect themselves. But what they're not going to do is they're not going to go out and try to stop somebody who is infringing your copyright, you know, outside of their website. I mean, if it's, if it's something that's happening like on MySpace, you know, MySpace may take action within MySpace. And whether it's a DMCA notice type structure or whether they just, yeah, right. If, if it was a terms of use violation, they might do something. Yes, sir. Well, if it's a if it's a if it's a featured artist, they're probably going to have a record company that's going to be part of a trade organization that is probably going to be picking and choosing their fights. I mean, what you have now is you have really for the first time um, people who are you know out front about like Pirate Bay, right? And these people have a political party. You know, in Sweden, they had they got thirty six thousand votes. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is very out in the open. I mean, when I first started in the music business, you know, counterfeiters and 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 pirates were like ex Arvin guys in Santa Ana. You know, and you you'd get a civil seizure and you'd go in there and they'd have like you know, you know, twenty keys of coke and a couple pounds of heroin. You know, and you know, a prostitution ring in the backyard. You know what I mean? I mean, you, these were bad people. Right, who kept it quiet, you know, who weren't in your face, you know. Um, now, I mean, those things may still be happening, but but what you hear, but they don't seem to be scared about it if they if they are. So I think they're probably not. But but what you what you find is people like the Pirate Bay, and you know, I mean, Sean, you know, for to a certain extent, you know, but Sean was always trying to make a deal. Pirate Bay is not trying to make a deal. So yeah, there'll, there'll be there'll be people who have money who can prosecute these things, but you got to pick your shots, you know, because there's, you know, the, the, the suing the user thing, thank God, you know, has gone away because that was never a good idea. That was a that was a Hillary Rosen special, you know, that we're going to be paying for for years to come, uh, literally and 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 from a publicity point of view. Yes, sir. You mentioned something yesterday at that forum. You said that. Uh, 360 deals have in some ways changed the, or made it harder for management to get paid. In 360. Right. I wondered if 360 deals have affected the way that lawyer, that entertainment attorneys are compensated. Oh yeah, sure. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, when you're an entertainment lawyer, music lawyer, um, you, you 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 work on two ways. Right? You get an hourly, or you work on a percentage. And um, people who are working on a percentage recently. Uh, in the decline in the music business have been having a very hard time. I have typically worked on an hourly basis myself um, because I like to get paid. I'd rather get paid less but know that I'm getting paid uh, rather than, than have it be 
have my compensation and my law firm and my employees subject to the vicissitudes of whether an artist is selling records or not. I just don't believe strongly enough in record companies, you know, to quite put myself in that position. But um, that's the way you usually get paid. So if you're if you negotiate a deal with a record company, the typical kind of attorney compensation today for, for a major label negotiation would be, you know, I get, you know, somewhere between five and 10% of what you earn plus I get, but that won't be less than, for the negotiation, the deal won't be less than, you know, 15, 20, 30, how, depending on how much time you put into getting that deal, shopping that deal, um, you'll, you'll get a higher cash payment. But once you've gotten the cash payment, if you anybody who's getting a percentage, whether it's a business manager, a lawyer, a personal manager, not the booking agent, because the booking agent is getting it, you know, the same way they always gotten it. But um, if you're one of those people, and the and the record company has taken all the income streams off the table and has paid in advance, that's recoupable against all those income streams, then unlike the old days where the artist's record deal might be unrecouped. Now, everything's unrecouped, right? So it's hard to attract a manager, the kind of manager that you need, you know, into that situation because they're going to say, well, where do I get paid? Because the advance, by the way, that is recoupable against all those streams is now lower than it used to be when it was just against the records, you know, very often. They don't, unless you've got a real competitive situation or a renegotiation, uh, where you've got like a corn or you know someone like that who's going in and doing a four record deal and they walk out with twenty five million dollars you know if if you're not if you're not uh, commissioning that kind of deal then it's really hard to imagine how a manager would stick around and and you really do need a manager I mean what managers do with la with artists is they, they they basically are the marketing department I mean this is becoming a manager's business much more so than it ever was before. And so, like, Lady Annabellum, for example, uh, which was a Nashville signing, um, they were going around shopping that deal, and, you know, they were, the manager is Gary Borman, who's Faith Hill's manager, and, and he's a really smart guy, you know, and he goes in, he just says, you know, I don't want your 360 deal. You know, uh, this, this is the deal you're gonna get. You know, you know, but but that was a very competitive situation, and the people who worked at the labels that were being told, no, you have to make a 360 deal, lost the deal. And one thing I can guarantee you is that Leo Cohen never picked up the phone to call Bill Bennett and said, "Good job losing that Lady Antebellum deal," right? So it's tough. You know, it's tough on everybody these deals because. You know, if you've got any kind of competition at all, you're not you're just not gonna make a three sixty deal, period. No manager in his right mind or lawyer in his right mind is gonna allow that to happen. And your competitors are gonna be who have who you know, you just had lunch with and they all swore up to yeah, we're all doing three sixty. All of a sudden they're not doing three sixty, right? They're doing whatever it's gonna take to sign that ban. And the reality is that once talent is gone, it's gone forever, you know, for you, if you don't sign them. So as I always used to say to the a &R staff at a and it don't matter if you find the band if you don't sign the band, you know. So when you put these burdens on people and their ability to sign these artists, it uh, it's, it's makes it very difficult for people to do their jobs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kaplan. Right. Thank you. Thank you.